my screen in the meantime. It's preparing it right now. It should be good to go. Okay, thanks, Sandy. All right, so yeah, welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, this is the second meeting of the Ocean Fronting Public Road Protection Rulemaking Advisory Committee. I'm Meg Reed, the Coastal Shores Specialist for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, and the person who will be leading this rulemaking process. Um, we are live streaming this meeting on our YouTube channel for any members of the public who wanted to view the meeting, and that will also mean it is recorded, and so it will be made available after our meeting is over. Um, so thank you all for being here and for uh, spending your time on this important issue. Um, I'll talk just a few just a few housekeeping items in the beginning of the meeting and then we'll open it up. The majority of our meeting today will be open discussion on the rule language. Um, so here's our agenda for the day. We'll do some introductions and then I'll review our rulemaking purpose and talk a little bit at a high level about goal two and the rule exception language as it's currently written and where our proposed rulemaking will fit into that. Then we'll talk about the draft language that I put out there, but it's just a starting point, so meant to be revised and changed and all that, and so that will be at the focus of our meeting today. And then we'll wrap up with just our next steps, what the date of our next meeting and our timeline process. So with that, I will start some introductions. So um, I said who I am already, but let's start with other DLCD staff. Um, Mandy, if you wanna introduce yourself. I'm Mandy McNabb and I am the administrative support specialist um, for the coastal division um, and uh, also handle coastal rulemaking administrative assistance. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go in the order I see everyone on my screen. Um, so if Beth, if you can go next. I'm Beth Stinnett. I live out at Cape Blanco down on the southern coast. Retired small business owner and just interested in this whole process. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And how about Cameron? I think you're on mute. <laughs> There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Cameron LaFollette. I'm the executive director of Oregon Coast Alliance, a uh, coastal environmental uh, land use um, activist organization. Our mission is to work on protecting uh, coastal natural resources and enhancing community livability on the coast. And we're involved in this because uh, coastal armoring and when and where it should happen is clearly a major issue for the future of both the people who live on the coast and the coast itself, the actual shoreline. Great, thank you. Uh, Chris? I'm Chris Lady. I'm the Tillamook County Public Works Director and County Engineer. Great, thank you. Laurel? Hi, Laurel Hillman, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, Ocean Shore Natural Resource Specialist. Thank you. Jeff? Hey everyone, um, Jeff Crook, I'm with the Oregon Department of Transportation. Um, I'm the policy lead with ODOT's Climate Office. Hey, thank you. Patty? Hi, I'm Patty Snow. I'm the Coastal Program Manager with DLCD. Thank you. Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Cribbins. I'm a Coos County Commissioner. Thank you. Jack? Hmm, still no luck there. That's not good. Um, I'm going to skip over for now. Uh, Lisa? 
Uh, Lisa Phipps, the uh, North Coast Regional Rep for the, the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Thank you. Uh, Hui? Hi, I'm Hui Rodomsky. I'm the South Coast Regional Rep for DLCD. Thank you. Thanks. And then Charlie? Hey, I'm Charlie Plavin. I'm the Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. Thank you. Um, I think that's everyone. Jack Stillwell is um, with the Emergency Management Group of Sandy Ann Pass, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, hopefully we can figure out a way to hear him <laughs> um, through the discussion. I think there's a chat. Um, and so, yes, actually, the next um, thing on our agenda is the land acknowledgement. So, Lisa, if you don't mind um, reading that for us, can you see it on the screen? I can. I can. Okay. Yep. I and we'd like to acknowledge the many tribes and bands who call Oregon their ancestral territory and honor the ongoing relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to this place we now call Oregon. We recognize the continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and thank them for continuing to teach us how we might all be here together. Great, thank you. Um, all right, well, no, that's great. Thanks so much uh, for everyone for being here and taking the time. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a few slides quickly and then we'll, get to the discussion. Um, so this should hopefully look familiar to you. This is our RAC charge from the Land Conservation and Development Commission. Um, and so I'll just read through it as a reminder that um, the reason we're here to do this rulemaking is to keep consistent with the principles of Goal 18, Beaches and Dunes, allow for the protection of important lifeline roadways on the coast through shoreline armoring when needed, support local government decision-making through the goal exception process, develop clear and focused rule language targeted to public ocean fronting roads only, and to ensure the new rule does not have unintended adverse impacts on coastal communities or natural resources. So as we discussed last time, this is a pretty narrow focused rule making endeavor um, to really target um, the essential roadways that are on the coast that run along the coastline and are ocean fronting um, to allow them to get a goal exception to go through the process of getting an ocean shore alteration permit um, for, for shoreline armoring, but only in the, under those circumstances in which it is really needed. And so trying to craft some language that is um, specific to that. Um, and, and so that's what we'll be talking about today. And this rule will live in the goal exception rule that already exists, which is in Oregon Administrative Rules, Chapter 660, Division 4. And I did provide you with that full rule language in the RAC packet. So hopefully you all had a chance to read through that. I know it is a little bit long and not all of it is applicable to this endeavor, but I, I provided it for you, hopefully, so that you could kind of couch this whole thing in the context of the rule. Um, and see where it all fits together. Um, so before I kind of talk through that, does anyone at this point have any questions about what we're doing or anything about process um, or, or anything at this point before we move forward? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm um, just gonna talk through a little bit high level. Hopefully you all have kind of gotten to this point already re reading through the rule. Um, uh, but just in case not, just wanted to kind of point out a few things about the rule exception language, that there are three types of exceptions that local governments can take to the land use planning goals. Those are irre irrevocably committed, physically developed, and reasons. Uh, physically developed is probably the most straightforward one. That's where something already existed, basically, at when the land use planning goals were put into effect. And so um, and and were, were things that would not have been allowed by the, the goals. So there are some examples of this even under goal 18 that might be um, fairly obvious to some people, like, for example, Pacific City in Tillamook County. Um, a lot of those houses were already developed 
um, in the 60s. And, and so they were built in what is a fordune, essentially. And so under goal 18, they would not have been allowed to develop those houses there, but they already existed. So they're allowed to continue to exist. So that's a physically developed exception. Irre irrevocably committed is sort of similar in that, you know, maybe those infill lots in Pacific City that weren't already developed with a house, but they were surrounded by other houses and that was kind of the only way they were going to be developed. That is that kind of committed exception. Um, and then the last one is sort of the catch all for everything else is reasons. Uh, reasons that justify why the statewide planning goal policy should not be adhered to in a specific circumstance. Um, and then, uh, so some parts of the rule touch upon those committed and developed exception areas. So we don't really need to think about or worry about those parts really. Um, the one, the kind of two sections that are the most applicable here are 660, 420 and 422. Um, 422 is, even though it comes numerically later, it is really the first one of, of importance. And so that's like the reasons themselves that you can use to justify an exception under the statewide planning goal system. There's a general catch-all reasons exception, and then there are specific ones based on specific goals. And that's what where, where we would be adding a new piece. And then once you kind of go through that and you qualify for one of those, then you go to the one before the 660-4-20, and there are four tests that must be met to either get a, an exception approved or denied under this rule language. Um, and so one of them is the reasons, um, then there's alternatives, consequences, and compatibility. And those are pretty high level. There's obviously a lot more detail within the rule language itself. But the point of, of saying all that is because the reasons exception that um, we're looking at is sort of one piece of an overall puzzle that, that a local government would need or an applicant would need to get to, to be able to get an exception approved. And so we're not necessarily looking to change those other pieces, although that's up for discussion, of course, but um, sort of one of the most straightforward ways of doing this is just to add the reason. And then those other tests will um, be, have it will have to be addressed anyway, as part of the process, hopefully. That makes some sense. Um, so any questions about the rule? It's the, the whole rule, the existing rule as it stands now. Okay. I think Mandy also said that she may be getting Jack to call in now. So Mandy. Yeah, I just called him on his line via our contact list. And he is trying it here now. He was getting the passcode and meeting ID mixed up, it looks like. Oh, okay. That's what I understood. Okay, thank you. What happens? Okay. So um, in the packet, I provided this um, rule language as a starting point. And again, it's just a starting point. This is really just to help get the juices flowing. And hopefully you've read it and have some thoughts about it that we can talk about today. Um, so I will just give you all a couple, like a minute to read through this on your own. Um, and I, I'm probably going to take this down so we can all just see each other more easily for a discussion. But if it is more helpful to have this in front of you um, on the slide, I'm happy to do that. Um, but just hoping to help facilitate the conversation as well. So I'll, I'll stop talking for a, for a minute. Okay, so any initial thoughts, feedback? I'm gonna stop my share. And if you have it in another means that you could look at, that would be good, but I can put it back up if, if people feel they need it. So I did have a, uh, a question. It might be already covered elsewhere. This is very specific to public roads, uh, which is the whole purpose of this meeting. 
but we get into some of the subdivisions that may be created prior and the subdivision roads are pre-1977 uh, or even post-1977, but they exist. There's no houses that separate the beach from the road. All the private development is on the other side of the road. Um, and I, I don't have an example, but because it's a private subdivision road, that would that be covered elsewhere? Before you get to the house, the road would have to be wiped out. Right. Um, yeah. So that would that's it does not have a specific reason under um, under the other parts of the rule. But it if that did exist somewhere and someone did want to get an exception, they could apply under the general reasons exception, which is sort of the catch all one um, that can be used in any case. I don't. I mean, that is something we can talk about too. I mean, I think sort of our intention was to kind of focus on public roadways, um, but there certainly are private roadways. And so, you know, if people have feelings about that or examples or um, thoughts, you know, we can discuss that too. I'm okay with keeping it as a public road, just keeps it nice and streamlined and simple, but I know that potentially that conversation could pop up and we, there is a, a mechanism for those landowners to go after an exception provided that they have justifiable reasons but mm -hmm. keeping it public makes it streamlined and gets rid of some of the complexities that we might deal with with private yeah okay thank you other thoughts Meg, i have a question just came yeah. on the uh and i'm not sure whether your language would cover this or not but there are roads on the coast that were slightly developed as of 1977, but became lengthened, expanded, widened, uh, and so on um, after 1977. So what would apply with respect to this rule in those many circumstances? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, and we can talk about that. We initially, I'll just say, you know, initially sort of what our, our intention with putting the date in was to keep it consistent, you know, with what the goal already says. Um, however, I do recognize that development dates for public infrastructure, you know, roads included can be difficult to track down. Um, I think it probably, I don't know, it might maybe depend on the section of road, like, you know, a whole road is probably not going to need an exception. I mean, maybe in some cases, if it's a really smaller road, uh, but you would just get an exception for the section of road that is vulnerable to erosion. Like for example, with Highway 101, you know, not all of 101 would get an exception. It would only be certain pieces of it. Um, I don't know. I mean, do you know of an example, Cameron, where that might be the case? Um, not specifically, although I was thinking of parts of of 101, which have been expanded or widened and uh, so on over the years since 1977. Um, and I'm not saying that it, that the a potential rule should be changed so that it should include all the later um, additions or improvements to the road, but just that that's a question that's probably going to come up um, and we should make a decision about it. Uh, my other question is that this, this language here doesn't have any um, sideboards about whether a portion of a road would get an exception or a whole road would get an exception. That might not be important if it's a two block long road, but if it's Highway 101, it's very important. Yeah. And I think yeah, so I think they have some defining language in there about uh, an exception only for that portion of the road that is currently threatened by whatever it's threatened by. Yeah. Um, so, kind of going back to your first question about you know the development date, I think probably the way it would end up, I mean, thinking of 101 as an example, you know, like many parts of the road had been developed in very early, like 20s, 40s, 60s. And 
I think that would well cover it under this. Um, like if it, any piece of that road had been developed as of 77, I think it probably counts um, under this, although we can talk about that. Um, and then the portion of the road, um, we can we can talk about, you know, we can experiment maybe with some language there. Um, for 101 in particular, um, it probably is easier to talk about that one because uh, because inherently the the goal exception processes are is already limited by its jurisdictional boundaries. So, um, you know, for example, in Lincoln County, Lincoln County can only take an exception for the pieces of road that are under Lincoln County's jurisdiction, and that would exclude the cities and exclude any other county area. Um, the same with you know for with Tillamook County, so that would already constrain which pieces of the road would be eligible. But you know we could say, I mean, it is supposed to be ocean fronting roads, but you could say ocean fronting roads that have that have been determined to be vulnerable to erosion. I mean, like that, that could be opening up a can of worms too, but I mean, we can explore that, you know, if we want to like talk about what are the criteria that need to be met for this road way to be eligible for an exception. Well, I think we're going to have to talk about some of the criteria uh, that a roadway would have to meet. Um, but I also think it is important to include language that makes it clear that an exception can only be taken for that portion of a roadway that is immediately in need of an exception. Uh, you know, I can certainly see how a local government or the state would think it efficient to ask for an exception for the areas that don't have problems now because then you can just not have to worry about it in the future. And I don't think that policy-wise is a good idea. Yeah. Any anyone else have thoughts about that, or or have suggestion for language changes? No, I I from the public work side, it's um, one. Uh, I don't believe anybody would be out there trying to do the shoreline armoring to protect a road if it wasn't threatened. But the when we go after the exception, I, I like the comment on sideboards because um, who knows what the future brings, and I think that asking for an exemption saying this is what's threatened, but then in addition to that, it's not just it's like a house. You don't, if you just stabilize the ocean front on that one particular house, do you cause other problems up and down the beach line? So by stabilizing that road right where it's threatened, that stabilization may need to extend out further so you don't cause undue harm. So the sideboards would need to be something to say it's not just right where it's threatened. It may go out longer to mitigate the armoring of the highway to stabilize that uh, failure, potential failure. Yeah, my understanding is the existing criterion for the regular exception too is that you're supposed to map it, right? You, you have to identify the location for the exception. So yes. it, it, it can't just be a blanket thing that covers you know the coast so um so i'm assuming that you know we have to go through this process anyway of really delineating clearly the specific site that we're talking about yeah you're right jeff thank you that is part of the exception process um i mean part, part of sort of the overarching thing about an exception is that it is a specific um it, it applies to a specific geography and is not does not have um, general zoning capabilities that is kind of like one of the defining things of an exception so it is sort of inherent to the process is being very localized like you have to very clearly define the the borders of that and so potentially maybe through the public process of such a such an application you know if if someone was trying to get too large of an area to be having an exception that might come out through the process and have to be whittled down um, through through that process but it's not not to say that we shouldn't put other sideboards on because we certainly could yeah talk about what that would look like and then we would also be impacted through the public involvement on actually getting the permit uh, from from OPRD. Uh, so even if we had an exception, um, 
to this an, an exemption, we're still limited to whatever OPRD is going to, you know, impose on us through developing. Um, so it's kind of a double check, I suppose it would be a good way to say that on the, uh, so we've got really two rounds of sideboards already. Yeah, that it, that is definitely something that will still have to happen is, um, at least for those structures that would be on the public beach, they'd still need, would need to go through the um, OPRD process, which does have standards that need to be addressed. Um, the one caveat I would say to that is just for any, any time a road could be protected landward of the OPRD jurisdiction, which is possible, and we have seen that before, um, and local jurisdictions vary a lot in what they require in, some of them don't necessarily require a special permit for that, um, but we are sort of working to update those regulations, but you know, it's a piecemeal process. Um, so that is the one area in which I would say that, you know, there is a possibility where there could be shoreline armoring proposed in areas that are not under OPRD jurisdiction, but under a local jurisdiction. And those additional sideboards might not be done through that. Um, let me just address a couple of chats that I had. Um, Jack had made a comment about um, limiting it to US highways that run border to border. So um, that's something we could talk about. Um, I think our intention was to allow any public road, not just high, not just highways like 101, um, but any ocean fronting road, but we can talk about that. Um, and then Charlie said, I know we've talked about um, in the goalie team group on the definition for beach run protective structure. Um, we did, I think, as a group in that goalie team focus group, and I can um, try and find it real quick so I can share it. Um, it still is not a statutorily defined definition, though. Um, so just make that um, comment that there is no definition for beach run protective structure, but we do have sort of a practitioner's version of that. Um, and then there is a number um, on the meeting that we just wanted to identify. I'm not sure, Jack, if one of those is you or someone else, who is the 514-639 phone number? A mystery person. <laughs> That doesn't match his phone number that I've called twice now trying to walk him through it, but okay. <laughs> I thought I'd ask. Okay, thanks, Mandy. Oh, it is Jack. Okay, great. Thank you. Um so Charlie, does that help? Do you want to talk about that anymore? I I guess my question is, is it limiting our only options for protections through a goal 18 exception? for a beachfront protective structure. Um, I mean, is it necessary to get a goal 18 exception? I mean, there may be other forms of uh, alteration, um, shoreline alteration that might benefit protecting the road that might not be a beachfront protective structure. So I'm wondering if we're limiting ourselves, if we're just using BPS as the boilerplate here. Well, I think because like, I think if I'm understanding correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, we're only, we only need to have an exception process for a beachfront protective structure. The other types of shoreline protective me measures that could be proposed that are non-structural would not need an exception. Um, so that's why that we're only focusing on beachfront protective structure for the exception is because that's the only case in which an exception would be needed for anything that is structural, basically in nature. Right. I guess my concern is that somebody argues that what they're doing is not a BPS. And given the fact that we don't have a definition there, then it kind of leaves that a little bit undistinguished. Yeah. Nobody's argued that before. I don't think, but I, yeah, there's, I mean, there certainly have been some gray areas and it's starting to become more and more, I would say. Um, so potentially. 
we could say um maybe it's not necessary now but it's something to keep in mind i think as as dynamic revetments become more dynamic they may become more structural it may become less clear what we're talking about um, between bps and then other types of uh revetments potentially so um I just think that might be something to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a it's a valid point. Um, there could be something maybe added to this that said, um, like st structural, like this is needed for structural erosion control measures or something like that. I don't know if we want to go down that route. The, the The other thing I would say, just as a general point that we can think about as a group, is um, we sort of have an ability to write sort of a white paper with this rule language if we want to, kind of saying like what our intentions are for this rule that are not necessarily part of the rule, but they are kind of included in um, with like with practitioners, you know, and, and that has been done for other rules in the past, sort of like, you know, our intentions with this rule kind of to like lay down the history of how it got to this point. So, you know, something like that could be added, like this is what we mean by a beach run protective structure. Um, so it's something we can think about. Question. We don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question in regards to timelines. On the Southern coast, we'll get slammed and I'm sure Tillamook has this experience also, where it there isn't time to go through a lengthy process because the road has literally disappeared. Mm -hmm. So do we need to also put some kind of, you know, if, if the road has disappeared, this is what we can do temporarily to... <laughs> put rock at the bottom of the, the hill to hold it while they go through this process? Or, I mean, um, we, get, we get slammed. And so, um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the soil is, is a clay mixture and it just literally slides off the side of the mountain. So that, that's just a comment also. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great comment. Um, uh, if we could just add an emergency quick fix language or process, something that they can at, at least do something to fill the hole, the void, be, and, and then go through the process. Well, uh, maybe I'll turn it to Jeff. I think there are some um, emergency provisions already for uh, at least for Highway 101 that right. can that's, do that's, that. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's this emergency urgency clause, and it's it's for all the natural resource permitting that's required. So um, it's not the outcome that everybody wants, right? Is to have right. that catastrophic failure, and then everyone's scrambling, and right. That's not the outcome, but you know, there is that provision. Um, I think I think the goal is to to try to be more proactive, so we do have outcomes that we can all agree on as far right. as yeah. what's being designed. You know, what does that feature look like? Right. Kind of mitigate it. Um, uh, and to Charlie's point, you know, there, there are a lot of different solutions out there now. And um, our, our agency is interested in, in the natural revetment concept. And so, you know, we, we know that there's kind of a gray area there too. Um, uh, but uh, I think that we need to be looking at all these options. Right. And, and yeah. the and the other point is, it doesn't always come from the same direction. So there's that w one storm every 50 years out of the West that suddenly hits an area that has never been in doubt before, and suddenly it is compromised. So, I, I, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here. There needs to be that oh my gosh, let's do something now to hold it in place until we can go through this process. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's kind of why we're trying to do this now and to create a, a, a specific reasons for these public roads right. so that we can do it now um, yes. <laughs> before that happens. But um, I don't know if this would be the appropriate place to put an emergency provision um, that might have to come 
I don't know, maybe a goal amendment to the goal itself, but some some revenue or some avenue that can be, that the door is open, so to speak, for them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is kind of covered, like just Jeff said, on the under that other emergency clause. Um, so that's good. And and OPRD, the State Park um, permitting program, does have an emergency um, uh, process for their riprap um, applications. However, that is still the eligibility is still required even under emergency circumstances. So. Um, at least for like a homeowner, you know, for example, not for the road, but for, you know, an individual homeowner that's experiencing a, a major emergency, they would still have to be eligible for um, beachfront protection under goal 18 for them to get an emergency permit. Okay. Meg, I have um, a question. Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. Um, ignorance mainly, and I'm hoping the public works people here could help me out. Are there certain kinds of beachfront protective structures that are um, most likely or most useful in road uh, assistance um, as opposed to types that are not really um, speaking, uh, you know, in an engineering sort of way uh, that are not really helpful? Uh, I'm just wondering if having some kind of language that speaks to the kind of beachfront protection that works for roads, uh, if there's a, a consistent or easily definable group of options um, might be a way to approach the question of what <clears throat> BPS is uh, for purposes of this rule. I, I mean, is it, for example, more helpful to have riprap and less helpful to have groins or the other way around? Or is there not a specific set of engineering options that one could really define that would be helpful? I'll take a stab at that. It's uh, no two sites are the same. Um, so when we do, you know, river, river bank enhancement, I got to, currently I'm going through an expedited permit process because the river is trying to take out a road we take a look at each one of these locations and determine what makes the most sense at that location. So while it's easy to say, you know, rip wrap, let's hard armor, everything um, gets the more fail safe. It may not be the best solution. So if a one size fits all or a two size fits all is really, you know, I, uh, from the engineering point of view, it, it's something that I tried to avoid because each site is unique. And I know that there's, when we were looking at it from the private development side, there were you know, a lot of different protective measures and structures that could be implemented. And each one had their, their pros and cons. So defining the, the roads separate than say a building, they're both structures and what is going to protect the building from falling in would also protect the road from falling in. The road is just gonna be a lot longer, which inherently is gonna cause potentially other issues because you're impacting more of the coastline. Thank you. I thought I was hoping that perhaps there was a, a a a way of doing things different and specific to roads that would help us narrow down the definition of BPS for this. But it sounds like not. It's it's more site specific than generic. The other thing that we take into account too is when we do something for a road improvement is. While maybe riprap is a preferred way to go, you know, soft armoring or something else is going to provide an equal level of measure of protection. But we're also going to see maybe improvements to habitat. So if we can do two improvements aesthetically pleasing as well, that might be the route we want to go. Even though hard armoring, you know, throwing a bunch of rock on the coastline um, <laughs> is, is certainly, you know, is, is an option. I'm not necessarily a fan. That's what we should do in every single location. In some cases, Absolutely. Other locations may not be the right approach. Yeah, I would echo those comments. I thought that was really well summarized. You know, every site's totally different. Um, it really depends on the geology, which can be really changeable from site to site, the elevation of the site, the road in proximity to uh, the shore zone area, to the beach itself. Um, and you've got the coastal process. You have different wave environments out there too. So um, 
you know, is going to be really an engineering solution that fits that particular site, the geology and the risk level. And there's a wide range of different options. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, that's, that's really where creativity can come in and try to come up with a good outcome. With, with all that said, you know, kind of getting back to Florence as she comes back to her chair, the, um, uh, the, the comment on emergency measures, um, which I, I think is lies outside of the, of the, of the rulemaking. You know, when we get into an emergency situation, there's only so much we can do in a short period of time. Uh, the comment previously about Highway 101 or, or highway that runs border to border, um, you know, I'll tie the two together. So Tillamook Sand Lake Road, it connects Tierra del Mar to Pacific City, runs down the coast. That is really the only secondary north-south route that is in that area. Um, 96, the road went, a uh, portion of the road. So the, the ocean is down below. It's quite a bit higher. Um, there's a, a rapid uh, fix. And then that was followed up by more of a long-term measure. So they, they put in rapid measures to get that up and running. And then they took that, that longer engineering approach of which if this is implemented, um, then that BMP, um, the, the, the protection measures would be something that would be taken into account on how do we treat it in the long term. So emergency hits, we're calling all the permitting people. Sometimes we're calling them after the fact, but when we're doing the work, we're also trying to take into account the least invasive. We're, we're really not trying to do anything other than stabilize the road or reroute people. We can just reroute people even better, but sometimes we can't do that. Thank you, Charlie, Chris. Charlie beat me to it. I was going to ask the same thing. Do we have any sense of how many ocean fronting roads there are apart from 101, which is obvious? N not uh, a really great beyond. one. Um, we've kind of tried to, to do that at the coastal program, at least to do an analysis of that. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to do, but um, we can try again to see um, if we can get something um, out there. I, and I can try to see in my notes too quickly while you continue to talk, um, if I can find um, something from our last go round at that. Um, but I would say, you know, like, I think what, what Chris just mentioned is a great example of an ocean fronting road that's not 101. So that's Sand Lake Road um, between Tierra del Mar and Pacific City. I know that there's also one in Seaside that's ocean fronting, vulnerable to erosion. That's not 101. Um, I think I there think probably well, aren't a lot of them. I but think there are some in Manzanita too. And yeah, the, city, mm -hmm. the roads that are in the neighborhoods that are right up next to the coast, I mean, to yeah. the beach, the nearest road, the road that goes between the first row of houses and the second row of houses are the roads that are probably are going to qualify for this. And I would guess that most towns have, and most coastal towns have at least one such road that goes mainly along the coast. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what about, and, and and what about roads along the bays, like the road from Newport to Toledo along Equina Bay? No, they're subject to goal 16. So they would be, and they, and actually all um, public facilities are allowed to get armoring under goal 16. So it's, uh, it's, it, it has a different set of regulations. So um, they would not be applicable in this um, circumstance. Do we have, is the language clear enough to make certain that we're only talking about the outer roads on the outer coast, not roads that go along bays. Yeah, because the first part says it's for goal 18. So it'd be only those places okay. that are subject to the provisions of goal 18 that would be applicable to this um, exception. Okay, but I do think the question of ocean fronting roads that are not 101 where they are and more or less how many miles are involved would be important because there's, I'm sure there are public roads in almost every coastal city. I wonder, um, since you kind of brought it up, Cameron, it came to my mind, like, I wonder if it's worth saying anything about, like, you know, what it, what this is not for. Um, so, for example, not for roads that are landward of houses, like if there's a road right behind houses, 
and the houses are at risk of erosion. This is not to protect the houses, it's protect roads. So like something to say, like, you know what I mean? You know what I'm kind of getting at? Like that it's not protecting a row of houses and then a, a road behind that. It's only if it's the, if it's just the ocean road. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, I think that's... some intention would be helpful somewhere there. Yeah. I, I feel this potential for kind of bootstrapping, if you will, um, which is a practice we already see happening around goal 18. So I could see it happening for this exception potentially. Yeah, um, does uh, maybe hold that thought for a second um, and maybe I can put the language back up and we can do some wordsmithing. Um, I just want to get to a couple other thoughts that came in and make sure we, we get to everything. So Melissa made a comment about um, in the draft, it says existed versus developed. And that's a good point. Um, so I'm just going to highlight that for when I put this back on the screen. Um, and there was something else. Sorry, I just need to go through my chats real quick. Um, oh, yeah. So Jack sent a message about, um, you know, under the sea level rise conditions that we're expecting and storm severity, um, is there uh, like sort of where where are we at with moving Highway 101 inland? And so I just wanted to bring that up to um, there. There is an alternatives type of analysis analysis that is required in the goal exception process. However, it's kind of. I would say it's meant for a different thing than this. So that is difficult. And so I think that's kind of one thing that I have struggled with is how you can require like an alternatives analysis of alternative, um, not alternative locations, which is really what the goal exception language is, but al alternative um, types. Um, so we kind of talked about that already. Like we don't, always just want to go to riprap as the first approach, like are there softer solutions that you could try first? And that is something that is part of OPRD's rulemaking process. So that is covered there. However, like I said, if this if it's not put under OPRD's process and is only subject to local governments, that's kind of a little bit of a gap. Um, and then uh, alternative locations. So like, how do you prove that this is the best approach for now and that rerouting the highway is not, not the best approach. So I think that's just something maybe we could talk about too. I think when we look at options associated with rerouting a highway, uh, you're going through the National Environmental Protection Act, uh, NEPA, um, and subsequently you're gonna be bounded by a lot of constraints. Um, it's so Cape Mears Loop Road. Uh, we closed it back in 2013 because of a of a landslide. It went through a full exhaustive uh, NEPA study, and the route is currently being constructed right now um, on the landward side. Um, it moves it outside of that, but it went through a pretty exhaustive environmental um, study. So a complete realignment of the road, pushing it away from the beach, or even a realignment of the road anywhere is going to trigger a higher level of uh, environmental study. And do you think that helps the argument one way or the other? You mean like if you were trying to do a moving it inward inland, like would that argument of doing the NEPA process, for example, and the alternatives, like would that prove that you want to just keep it where it is? Is that kind of what you're saying? Well, what what I'm saying is that you end up you end up answering the question. So Charlie's email that popped up or text that popped up chat was shouldn't we in, in be incentivizing those type of scenarios? And anytime we can move a structure, whether it's a bridge, a culvert, we actually took a bridge out of service that was no longer needed. But anytime we can move a structure out of a hazard, the less we have to maintain or repair or, or deal with the future. Sometimes though, removing something out of a hazard area may actually cause a worse, worse condition. You know, it's the unintended consequences. And that's why those higher level environmental protection needs to take place to understand what are the true impacts if you relocate the road. Um, so projects as large as moving Highway 101, um, that money is gonna come from federal highways. 
There's, there's no other source of funds, USDOT, and that's going to fall under the, the federal uh, NEPA policy. So I, I agree. I'd like to see, you know, push them away from the ocean. Um, but do you take out an entire hillside to do it? it, it that's a bad example. Um, the pushing Sand Lake Road further inland is going to do some significant impact to to a wetland area and a uh, uh, salmon refugia. So these unintended consequences. It's it's ideal move them away from the hazard, and that's always the number one goal. Get get rid of the hazard entirely. Not always possible. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Um, all right, I'm going to put the text back on the screen. Are there any other thoughts that I either missed in the chat or that um, people want to say that we haven't said already? Um, I did just get another chat from Jack. Um, from a severe emergency disaster, Highway 101 is not a usable option. Are all the emergency plans oriented for only east-west traffic? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I don't know, Jeff, if you do. I guess that maybe is like a catastrophic failure. There are some other alternatives north-south that are not state roads, and that varies, right, from jurisdiction to juris jurisdiction. I'm, I'm not clear on the question. Is it about emergency plans for east-west routes as opposed to north-south? Or I, th I think the question is, if Highway 101 is not usable, what is the backup, the emergency plan? But I think it varies, right, would be my impression. It varies. We have maintenance districts up and down the coast that are kind of geography-based. Each district has like a routing plan. And if there's a closure, they usually know where to direct the state highway traffic. Um, sometimes there's there's another route that, that works. Other times there's a few segments, especially down in Southern Oregon, where if a segment closes, the state highway traffic's is kind of forced to go inland back over the coast range and back around to get back to the coast again. So. There are sections where there are detours that are more kind of localized, and but there are sections where it's much more challenging. So um, anyway, yeah, look into it. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's helpful. I, I mean, I think that yeah, again, kind of highlights the point of why we're trying to do this. Um, you know, there we're certainly not advocating to have more riprap, generally speaking, but um, in some places it it's sort of a lifeline, life safety type of um, circumstance where, you know, 101 is a pretty critical route for lots of reasons. And then some others, you know, local roads are similarly very important and vulnerable. Um, and so, so this, this rulemaking is really try to, trying to address that, but not to have these other things that others have pointed out, these, you know, bootstrapping attempts or attempts to try to protect other things that are not important roads. Um, so I think that's kind of what we want to think about in this rule language. And um, one thing, you know, that is in the end of this section is, you know, roads that dead end at the ocean shore or otherwise run perpendicular to the ocean shore are not eligible for this exception. So kind of thinking in like those frames, like what is not some, what is not what we intend here? And so maybe we can add some to that. So I wanted to maybe open it up to some wordsmithing, if people are open to that. We are at about three o'clock, so we have another about half hour, 40 minutes to do this before we want to wrap up the meeting with other next steps. I just want to piggyback on the, the, the previous conversation. When 101 shuts down, and it shuts down in Tillamook several times a year because of flood, all the traffic is rerouted onto county roads. Um, this is that localized. The same thing would happen on 101 where the traffic gets routed onto Sand Lake in that, that piece of, of land. So that north-south component that 101 serves when that segment of 101, you know, uh, shuts down, the rap traffic is oftentimes routed on a county road. And some of them are along the, um, along the ocean shore. So I believe that, you know, these comments with the public infrastructure, regardless if it's Highway 1 and 101 or others, it's public roads. And I would really like to keep it. 
Uh, Meg, were, uh, weren't we also uh, considering language that would, um, what you suggested, make it clear that we're not talking about roads that are uh, between houses and the shore? Yeah, how, how do other people feel about that? Do we wanna add something about that? Yes. I, I would say if there's houses between the road and the shore, if you can't protect the houses, then um, the, the road would not fall under that exemption, but the county or the state or the city could apply under a different uh, reason um, for an exception. But I would say if you can't stabilize the houses, then it's a much bigger issue. And do you really need the road at that point? Maybe you do. But I think I guess there's another my, avenue to do that. Yeah, yes, definitely. Do you think the language as it is now is clear enough that that is true? Or do we need to have a caveat in there that says like houses are not like this is not an exception to protect houses this is an exception to protect roads i'm i'm trying to figure out the situation where that would happen i mean because i i see a lot of situations where houses would be incidentally protected hmm. like you know we have houses on the eastern side of 101 that if you lost 101 you know you would lose the house eventually too yeah do you uh, I mean, can you think of a situation where that would be the case I'm going to say if you've got the beach and you've got a row of houses and then the road, the I think the abuse would come in is that the argument is to protect the road by protecting the houses. And people right. would, would misuse that or try to make that interpretation otherwise. I think it would just be very easy to misinterpret or misuse, not misinterpret, but purposely you know, misuse that. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm sort of afraid of. And so I'm wondering if we need to add some language here to make it more clear that that is not what we're intending here. Uh -huh. There's like the, the term development is defined in the, in the rule or the goal as, as far as, you know, it's, it's really private development in kind of classifying what development can get exceptions. And so this whole process is really focused on the public, the public infrastructure that wasn't covered in, in the definition of development. Is that correct, Meg? Because it yes. seems like we can keep it, if we keep it in separate, I think it, it you know, logic follows that either the houses are eligible for protection or they're not. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, and it, I guess that would then, you know, like if if we're following that, like then it would be like under up to basically every local jurisdiction. If someone came to them and said, we want to apply for this exception to protect our house, which is not eligible because it would protect this road, then it would be sort of the jurisdiction and maybe with our assistance, you know, as as the agency who's written these rules to say, no, actually, you don't qualify for that type of an exception. If you want to do that, you have to go through this other exception pathway. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, Melissa and then Laurel. I was just wondering if you just put the word primary in front of purpose, does that resolve the issue? Where is that? Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Between, for the primary purpose, I mean, because protecting the house would be a secondary purpose, even under the scenario that I described. Yeah. I, yeah, that could be a good addition. Laurel? I was going to suggest adding the word oceanfront, potentially, before public roads and highways, if that would help clarify this issue. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. It probably should be in there. I don't know how it isn't. <laughs> so that's a good point, Laurel. I think that solves hey, the can, problem right there. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you have a a term here, roads that dead end at the ocean shore or otherwise run perpendicular or not eligible. Um, and so that would mean that, for example, an OPRD parking parking lot at a park that is you know, dead ends at the shore because it's in the dunes um, and it starts to suffer erosion would not qualify because it dead ends 
uh, on the ocean shore, right? Yes. Is that what we intend is that waysides and parking lots that are right on the ocean shore would not be eligible for an exception? Uh, Correct. I mean, that is our, that's kind of our intention at the moment, and we can certainly talk about this, but um, I mean, and Laurel can maybe speak to this too, but I, I mean, my understanding from parks perspective, OPRD's perspective, is they generally have like a, a retreat kind of um, mentality where like they would take parks facilities away from the ocean over time. Um, generally, I mean, like under the existing definition of development, parks facilities are not eligible for beachfront protective structures. Um, and so when sort of my intention for adding this, the dead end thing is that, I mean, that um, that sort of comes up, you know, as, as you probably know, like if there's a house on one side and then there's a dead end of a street and there's a house on another side, a lot of those dead ends will end up being armored because of, you know, the the premise that you need to protect both houses. And so you don't want like these edges and scouring and, and that's a fair enough argument. But the point is that those roads don't do anything. Like that's just the dead end. They're not part of a transportation network. They're not part of a lifeline route. They're not going anywhere. Um, so they don't need to be protected with shoreline armoring. If other people feel differently or strongly or have an argument otherwise, um, let's, yeah, let's talk about that. But that's kind of where our, our intention came from that is like, we don't want those types of things to be eligible for armoring. Yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily arguing in favor of it, was just um, interested primarily in what OPRD, which owns a lot of oceanfront waysides and dead end parking lots right on the ocean shore, uh, thinks. And if they are interested in um, being included in this or, or, or not. That would have to be a conversation um, <laughs> above my pay grade um, to answer your question, Cameron. Um, but we have had conversations in the past that go in the direction of what Meg said from at least a few, you know, certain uh, managers at OPRD had that perspective that there would be a retreat strategy um, for non-essential resources of the the park system, but I imagine there could be some examples of <clears throat> situations where you couldn't retreat that structure um, that some folks might have a different perspective on it, but I would have to go and check. If we were, if we were going in that direction, my feeling was that this was primarily about roads and those aren't roads. So if we were gonna ask that question, I would have to bring it to a different group of folks to get their perspective on that than just myself. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that because it hadn't come up at all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, yeah, I would, I mean, I guess at this point, like that's really what our focus is on the roads that are doing something and um, and I'll, I'll open it up to Charlie, but I just, maybe I'll add to Chris's point too um, about a dead end road onto the beach. So for like emergency access, like I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't necessarily need riprap to get emergency access onto a beach. Like you could do a ramp and that's certainly allowable under this already existing circumstances. Um, and, and if it was a road that say like is perpendicular to the ocean shore and it it's vulnerable, but like it only is serving a smaller group of residents. Like, again, I don't really think that's the intention of our allowing this exception. This is really to kind of have like that broader life safety kind of perspective. Like we want to be protecting roads that are that are larger parts of larger transportation networks um, and not really just serving a small group. But for emergency access, I, I mean, I agree. I don't want to take emergency access away, but I think that's already sort of allowed and wouldn't need an exception. Um, but Charlie, you have your hand up and want to make sure to get to your point. Well, yeah, I think Cameron kind of touched on my original question, which was, are we talking ocean front or ocean shore? Um, and I, I get us being like kind of laser sharp, narrow and addressing public roads here. Um, I think that's a smart way to draft rule exceptions. Um, I, I do want to maintain that I, I actually think that these, you know, roads that terminate uh, in the ocean shore are critically important from a planning perspective. Um, and they do serve a purpose. Maybe you don't see them now, but I, I do think that those are kind of future access opportunities or emergency access opportunities. 
in a lot of cases, they may become the only publicly owned areas on our shoreline one day as it erodes and uh, sea level rises. So I think from a planning purposes, we should consider those areas. If we don't want to do it in this rule, I, I, I would impose upon DLCD and local planners that those, those roads that terminate in the ocean shore are pretty important. Um, and that's kind of what I was thinking about the definition of beachfront protective st structure. I wouldn't want it to get in the way of an access opportunity, um, particularly an emergency one. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I think and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong too, Charlie, because of your experience with public access points, but I don't think of those as beachfront, as needing beachfront protective structures. Um, I mean, sometimes they, they happen over beachfront protective structures, but I don't think a public access point needs to be a beachfront protective structure. Like public access is certainly protected under goal 17 and other avenues and local governments have requirements to keep those in place. Um, but I don't know that you need a beach and protective structure to keep access, but maybe I'm wrong. I think in some cases they may be dependent on how you engineer the shoreline. And I'm not saying that I'm advocating for BPS, um, uh, you know, in parks and in other access points. But I think about an area like the Nye Beach turnaround, where mm -hmm. you also have some, you know, city infrastructure like sewer or um, stormwater or otherwise that are kind of built into the termination of that street, mm -hmm. um, which does require some protective structures around that to keep the integrity of the beach and the safety of the, the area for access. Um, again, I'm not advocating for, I'm just trying to think through what I see out there. Um, and I don't know that that ramp down to the beach would even be possible without the seawall adjacent it um, in some way. So I, again, uh, I'm just trying to think through uh, what's out there right now and how this might apply to what's existing as much as things that are new. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just offer too, like I know that this has come up for par parks permitting re you know, recently, you know, like in Bandon, there was a culvert area that needed to be replaced that opened up onto the ocean shore and that was allowed to go through with some like, you know, riprap rocks, but it wasn't a riprap revetment. Like it was, it was pieces of rock that went around the culvert to allow the culvert to be there. And, and that was fine. Um, so I think the same would probably be here. Like that would be the case. Like if it's not meant to necessarily be a riprap revetment that's protecting from the, you know, from coastal erosion, then it doesn't really qualify as a beachfront protective structure. But I think you're right, like there's still some murkiness around that. Um, so, I mean, like, do you, would you advocate for not having that sentence in the language? Or others, how do others feel about that sentence? Well, I think that's why I put that question in there was like, what are we trying to do with that sentence exactly? And if it's eliminate any of those roads from this exception, I would I just want to make sure that that's not already problematic. Like so there's some we, level of analysis. Say non emergency roads that dead end at the ocean shore or otherwise run perpendicular are not eligible. So that a, we give a, an open door to an emergency access, like Chris Lady said, there's an access at Oceanside that's the only access for uh, first responders for several miles? The, the problem with that is every road that accesses the beach is an emergency route. Every road in Tillamook County that goes up the hill is a tsunami evacuation route. Um, so what is the definition of an emergency route? Either you've got to get that from the first responders who sometimes will sway with the public the problem I run into that is with my, my comment, this one is fairly straightforward because there's no other beach access points that vehicles can get down. But I go into um, Neskowin. Neskowin would be an example where every single road, and I've had one person claim an emergency route, even though you drop 20 feet down through rock to get out to the ocean, claim that was an emergency route. So the defining it sometimes works against us too. 
Well, is there a definition somewhere in state statute or um, federal law of an emergency? I'm just trying to figure out if there's some way to clarify that last sentence so we do something but don't do the wrong thing. I can address Curry County in the fact that all the EMTs, all the emergency services, it's a, a great deal like Tillamook County in the fact that anything that you can get the ambulance down to the beach is utilized. Um, so unfortunately, and those, those roads are not protected, they're just goat trails usually. And so yeah, I, I can see where this would cause some problems if in the future, particularly like Reedsport where they have all the beach dune buggies, the number of severe injuries that occur in that area uh, that are uh, neck and back injuries, the closer they can get that ambulance to that individual, the better off they are. So yeah, that's, this is a bad one. <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, like in Reedsport, I mean, things could always yeah. change, but like they have a lot of, they do not have an erosion problem. They have an right. hydration problem. <laughs> right. um, so don't. I don't know that they would be putting up some riprap anyway there. Uh, right. But I can, yeah, I can address Kate Blanco, for instance, there was a hang glider who was injured out there and they had to go down. We had to go down through the state park. There's a goat trail down and that's, how we got down there and it's so in the future if there are going to be more and more people accessing the beaches there are going to be more and more injuries on the beach so are we shooting ourselves in the foot here maybe we should just not address it and it's it's silent <laughs> something for another day <laughs> I'll turn it over to Melissa and then yeah. I'll say what I feel like anyway. Yeah. I think it's an interesting question because the, the question is you know, like, what exactly are we trying to get at? We've already got it narrowed down to the road has to be developed on or before January 1st, 1977. It has to be ocean fronting and it has to be public. So we've already knocked out a lot of the things that we would be concerned about, right? New developments going in, putting in a road, um, having, you know, armoring for houses. So I, I just, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to run scenarios through my mind of um, where would this fall that we would be opening the door to something that we didn't intend to allow armoring. And I'm not coming up with a lot, but. Well, I think, I think I feel like I could see it happening with the bootstrapping scenario and like that already happened. So maybe we don't really care that it's going to continue to happen because maybe there are some public benefits to that where, you know, like Charlie said, you have public access maintained and right. maybe it helps with the emergency vehicle access. So we're not really that concerned about some dead ends that get armored right. because it's fairly small space tent, you know, typically anyway, it's a pretty small space. Um, I just, I'm concerned about people using this as a means to get their ineligible properties armored because it also is near a road end. Right. And I also wonder how many local jurisdictions would go through an exception process to get a road end in an exception. I mean, it's a fairly onerous process to get an exception, a goal exception. Right. And I'm not sure how many would actually go through the effort to do it for a road end, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, Chris or Jeff, if you guys have any thoughts on this one. Seems I ridiculous. <laughs> I, I can't think of a spot where I would try to go through that. Usually it's already a ramp that goes down there. Um, okay, here would be an example. Uh, the uh, Pacific City ramp that goes down too, that was constructed a few years back. It would, uh, it actually, the road's been there since before 77. A ramp was installed to get the Dory fleet out to the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a lot of uh, coastal erosion through there and started undercutting that. Fortunately, the sand came back in, there wasn't a problem. 
that's actually a county road by definition. It's within the right of way and everything else around it is, is county property, but there, it's not a road. That's a road. So it's, it's got a lot of importance for all kinds of reasons. Emergency vehicle access is, is certainly one of those. But that would be a location where we would go through an exemption to try to shore that up. That's the only way I can come, come up with that in Oceanside. Those two uh, roads that dead end onto the beach. Uh, Provided that was an area where you needed a beachfront protective structure. Yeah. Is there some way that we could put language in there that keeps that uh, that last sentence, but makes it clear that uh, it is not for the sake of bootstrapping individual properties uh, on the road? I don't know how that could be wordsmithed exactly, but is there some way to clarify it like we did above? Well, I think having that sentence means that you would not run the risk of getting bootstrapping, but if you remove the sentence, then there is a risk of having bootstrapping. Okay. So... I mean, it seems like, I don't know, let's do a quick poll just to see where everyone's at. It sounds like maybe some people are, are feeling good that we could just take out that sentence and that would be okay. Like the sort of scenarios we've run through of like what we would be af afraid of happening are probably unlikely. So we could just get rid of this for clarity's sake and, and for the sake of that, maybe in some instances it might be okay for these areas to be armored. However, you know, does some people feel like that's not okay? They want to keep this in to to prevent armoring of 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 street ends. Charlie, your hand is up. Well, I just wanted to kind of clarify the reason, which is the the heart of what I was getting at in the first place, which is the reason that sentence is in there is from a bootstrapping perspective. Mm -hmm. That was the, 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 the purpose that it is to serve. Yeah. And to really make sure that the roads that are getting armored are ones that are providing a transportation purpose and not just like either a small neighborhood where, you know, maybe managed retreat as an option for them in the future or, um, or just to get some bootstrapping. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm sorry to come are you completely making those types of roads ineligible for an exception by putting this sentence in there? You're making them um, not eligible to use this exception, but they could still apply for a general reasons exception. They could still apply for a general reasons exception. Correct. Okay. Cause that, 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 okay. That matters to me. Okay. Okay. I'm okay with leaving that language in um, as long as, they could apply for a general reasons exception if, for example, the uh, ramp at Pacific City crumbled or the Oceanside access crumbled, uh, they could still get an exception somewhere. I think it's important to have this language in that to prevent bootstrapping, um, but they need to have some option if there's a serious problem where a road that's an important emergency access, not a goat track, but you know, a, a, one that's used more frequently than that uh, can get an exception if they're threatened with erosion. So I would, given that they can get one elsewhere, I would rather leave this language in. Okay. I can double check with our legal counsel to make sure I'm right in that, that we're not excluding them from all exceptions, but I, I'm pretty sure that that is, that is true. I don't know if Patty, if you have any thoughts on that one, if you want to jump in. Um. Hi, thanks, Meg. I, no, I agree with you. I think that's the case, that it would just mean they couldn't apply for this particular reason um, exception, but it wouldn't preclude them from, in my, you know, it would be double, good, good to double check with Steve, but I don't think that it would preclude them from applying for the, the general um, exception. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, you, you have your hand up. Oh, sorry. Jeff, I'm sorry, you were talking. <laughs> sorry, I don't have my hand up. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, you could say reason exception at the end there, just to make it super clear. For this, yeah. Well, the other one would be a reasons exception too. Oh, never mind. But 
this Great specific for, for, for <laughs> this uh, transportation uh, or road reasons exception or some language that yeah. narrows it down. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, I'll add that for now. Okay, Chris. Whatever we write in there, we also need to be aware that we changed the previous structure or the previous sentence to say primary use of protecting ocean fronting public roads. My first thought was that that word primary would help to offset the bootstrapping and, and I don't think that would. So, so I, I, I like the sentence as it is. Um, I don't oppose it because we can certainly go after another exemption. Just paying attention to the word primary and as we start getting into some of the others. But as long as I can apply for an exemption or an exception under a different rule if I need to, I'm okay with that. Okay, so then you're okay with the language that's proposed. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing, well, two more things maybe, and we're getting close to time, so just want to time check, but two two phrases I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, one is the existed versus developed, and I think Jack sent also a message about um, was in use on. Um, so maybe let's talk about that. And then the other thing that was pointed out to me was uh, nobody has said it here because I think we all work in this realm, but like is protecting clear about what we mean by protecting? Um, so any thoughts about, so that's, uh, you know, permitting beachfront protective structures for the primary purpose of protecting ocean fronting public roads and highways that either existed on, were developed on, or were in use on January 1st, 1977. Any thoughts on that? I think well, are, you, are you thinking of like putting in some other language like protecting from erosion or uh, something that makes more specific what you mean by protection? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, I think in this realm, I feel like people probably kind of understand that in a general sense, but I don't know. Maybe, it, maybe it's not as common as we think. Stabilizing, yeah, that's a suggestion. Primary purpose of stabilizing ocean fronting public roads. I would say, I, I wouldn't take out protecting. You might say the primary purpose of protecting uh, and stabilizing, uh, stabilizing ocean fronting public roads that were developed uh, by January 1st, 1977. You have to take out on and put oh, on. Yeah. Thank you. That were developed by. Oops. Any other thoughts? So it was protecting and stabilizing. And the other thing you could say is <clears throat> from ocean erosion, but with, does that cover all cases? Yeah, because there could be, I mean, maybe landslides are really the what's right. happening. Or sure. collapse of a dune or a collapse of a sand cliff, which is sort of erosion, but is a separate subcategory. Actually, I think the languages should be were developed as of January 1st, or is it by? What is the, what's the actual language of the rule? Yeah, let me look it up really fast. Um, it says January, word, let's see, where development existed on January 1st, 1977. So word developed on, I think we could say. Okay, because on usually sounds like it had to be done on that day. So I just well, we have, I mean, that, that actually is a good point, because that actually has come up, you know, in our interpretation of that, um, that there was a house, it was removed. And then on January 1st, 1977, that house did not exist. And then a house came up, you know, maybe a few decades later, they are not eligible for a riprap because they did not have a house on January 1st, 1977. So that's kind of been our, our pretty strict input implementation of that development date. We don't necessarily have to be exactly the same, but. Um, well, I think we should be the same since we're in the same rulemaking. So whatever the 
best language is in the rule we should use the same here whether it's developed by or developed <laughs> on or developed as of or whatever the best yeah. whatever the same language is let's see it could be a question that we could further ask to our legal counsel to see if he has a helpful answer to that um uh, so comment from Lisa, uh, it seems the word protecting doesn't necessarily mean that it is imminently threatened. And it seems like it could open the door for someone to argue that they need to put in riprap to protect it from possible threats. It's a good point. Yeah, that's true. You could say from of protecting from imminent, from an imminent coastal hazard, <laughs> from an imminent threat. There's Laurel, do you know, I think imminent threat is defined Yeah, that language authority. is in our, I was going to say something about that. Yeah, okay. imminent, I have to look at the exact language, but it, the word imminent is in there. Imminent well, peril would, or something like that. I think it would be good to, if it's, if it's already in the rule, I think we can echo it safely. Uh, if it isn't, I wouldn't want to put it in there because it's imminent. What does that mean when you get to Right, yeah, like, off, yeah. Right. Um, so, and courts of law need bright line standards as much as possible. Um, but if it's already in the rule and has therefore uh, been worked with for many decades now, I think it would be fine to put it in here as a defining term per point. I agree with Lisa, protecting is a curious word that is broader, could be broader than we might intend it to be. Unless we put imminent threat in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of these sort of extenuating circumstances that are within the permitting process, right? Like your alternatives analysis, like all these other sorts of things. How 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 much of that are we putting in this this rule here? Um, I mean, how much of that do we want to mirror here? particularly given the intentions of goal 18 and how that's reflected in the permitting process for BPS. Are you, are you saying that like, we don't need to be redundant because it's other, other places or that we no, should I'm be asking redundant. the question, do we? <laughs> okay. Because I'm hearing some things that are, you know, like, well, you know, what do we mean by protecting and under what circumstances? Um, and I would, I would also ask all these other questions that the permitting process does ask and, I guess I feel like that permitting process really reflects goal 18 well in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And I'm kind of curious, how do we reflect what's in that permitting process in this draft rule language? Or do we? Yeah. But it's kind of a bigger question when you ask about imminent threat and you talk about coastal hazards. And then I, I think about all the, the devils in the details of the as-built structures as proposed in the permit application, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, th I think, um, I don't know that we have to be like fully redundant, but there probably are maybe some places where it wouldn't hurt. Um, and how would I let, how about Chris, you talk, and then I'm going to try and find something while, while you're talking to help with this. Yeah, I'm just kind of looking at this slightly different because we're dealing with public roads. It is I can't see a scenario where any county or city is going to spend money to protect a road that's not of concern to failure. Um, not to mention it might be difficult to go through a public hearing process or the public uh, comment period as we go through the permits. Not to say that that won't happen. I'm struggling to find a scenario where a public entity would spend money to protect something that's not at risk. Just, just my comment. Yeah, I, I think that's also a good, a fair point um, that like, you know, who is this directed towards um, and what kinds of information are they going to have available and what, I mean, you know, Jeff can talk about, I'm sure, like how many studies they have done on Highway 101 and alternative measures and all these kinds of things to kind of, I, that I think will be really important in the exception process that you've already kind of done a lot of the groundwork for. And I'm sure that would be the case of other public entities too. Um, so I don't know that we have to have all those 
uh, details in there because they will be covered elsewhere um, within the goal exception process at the local government level, within local permits, within OPRD's permits, um, and then you know of course any federal permits that might be needed if they if they do get invoked, depending on where it's being built. So um, we certainly don't necessarily need to add additional complexity if it's not really going to add value. Well, some of these, this is going to be put in the middle of the uh, administrative rule on exceptions and the rule starts with a bunch of definitions, Yes. right? Uh, mm -hmm. So anything that's already defined in the rule or in the statute that the rule is um, bringing out the details of, we should be okay with. Like if we put imminent peril in and imminent peril is already defined as Laurel has uh, uh, posted it on the chat, we're not going to be adding to our difficulties because it's already a defined term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, pro yeah, we could say imminent peril and we could maybe say like as defined in and because that that rule is not in the DLCD rules, it's in OPRD's rules. So it would be good to just reference it. But yeah, you're right. It means already defined. So um, how do people feel about that? Adding that it must be imminent peril. I think the imminent peril piece is in the emergency permit section, though. I it I is. I go back and check. So, I mean, yeah, it's not the same thing exactly for public roads. It wouldn't necessarily have to be an immediate, like, emergency situation peril to want to fix it. I don't know. I'm just talking out loud here. So, I was just posting it so that folks know that it is defined, but it is in the context of an emergency permit. So, yeah, I don't know if it's the same thing. I think keeping it simple makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think trying to define protection is kind of missing the point because it's beachfront protective structure. <laughs> that's what that's, a, you know, this is what the exception's about. So I think that's in, you know, that's in the goal language. Um, so I think if you start putting in more terms, it just creates more slippery slope of well, what what is an imminent peril? You've got to go cross-reference everything. And um, I think keeping it, kind of broader makes sense. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I just, I, I'm fine with that too. I just wanna make sure we address Lisa's point that uh, protecting doesn't necessarily, may not necessarily mean that it's uh, imminently threatened and could open the door for people to argue they need to put in riprap to protect from possible threats. Yeah, it, no, we don't essentially, Maybe that could be kind of addressed, I think, throughout the rest of the exception process and sort of like the, the other tests of the exception. Um, if, it, if it seems clear that, that's, that it's not really threatened, then hopefully that would become clear and the, the local government decision makers would deny it based on that. But that's still kind of opening it up to a little bit of interpretation. So. Um, I think it does go back to Chris's comment, though, which is, you know, how many of these local governments have the money to be investing it in something that isn't actually threatened? I know we surely don't. Yeah. And the states, the states in the same boat. We're, <laughs> you know, we're, yeah. I've always hoped I mean, the state was better off than Coos County. You're not making me feel any better. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> I hold my tongue. <laughs> Okay, well, it sounds like maybe then we feel okay with it. Um, what about, so there's, for the primary purpose of protecting and stabilizing ocean fronting public roads, do people like that addition or not? That works for me. Laurel? We removed the thing about dead end roads, yes? Or did we leave it in there? We left it in there. So I just thought of an example. Okay. Let's uh, hear it. At Cape Arago, um, technically that's a dead end public road. 
So I don't know. It's just an example of a more, you know, it's not a short dead end road. It leads to a lot of infrastructure and it's the only in place to get in and out of that whole section. I don't know if there's other examples. I just, just came to my head just now, just a thought. Are there other Is examples? that like the Cape Arago Highway, you mean? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, I mean, in other places it is parallel to the ocean shore. So it could still, it would still qualify for an exception in those sections. Okay. Even though it's not, I guess, because it dead ends is not, as long as yeah, it's I mean, parallel. I, what I'm saying with the dead end thing is like literally the dead end section of road. And that is the only section that would not be eligible. So if it if it's still like if the road itself dead ends but like is parallel to the ocean shore it would still be eligible under this exception. It would just be like that little section that like is literally the last part of the road. You know, in some places that like there are a lot of places where that like Lincoln City, you know, like every road dead ends into the ocean. And we don't want necessarily a bunch of riprap at the ends of those. Even though I'm sure at this point all of them are riprapped anyway. But um that's kind of what I'm talking about. But if that's not clear, then maybe it needs some. Maybe it is. I mean, you meant dead ends, like dead end roads, but not highways that there aren't that many examples of highways that. Dead it's end true. Yeah, highways. that's a good point. Like that, that certainly would be one. What about this just go last to comment that somebody put in? The rule would also apply to logging roads on state or federal property. Is that right? Um. I guess so, right? Because that would be like a public road. But they're, they're public roads. I can't I think, think of any place where those are ocean fronting. Uh, it is possible on Cape uh, Lookout and on uh, Cape Mears has property like that. I don't think there's any logging roads, but Lookout does. That would apply to. Does Niakani also in the back, in the, not the front state park side, but on the private property that's, uh, you know, more on the back side have any? So I, I can't think of any, anything there up on Niakani. OPRD actually owns quite a bit west of the, uh, west of the uh, highway. Um, I'm going to pull up a map right quick. Let me look to see what's up there. Pull it up on my other screen. So. Keep talking. Well, it wouldn't apply to, to private logging roads, only logging roads on state or federal property, but are they, so here's where I'm not clear on road definitions. Is a logging road technically just because it's on public property, is it a public road? Aren't there some logging roads that are, even though they're on public property, they're not really public roads. They're not to a standard that the public is uh, allowed on or encouraged to be on, or is there no definition that makes that distinction? A road can be a goat trail. It can be a two track uh, road. It could be a single track road because it carries a vehicle. That vehicle could be, could be a motorcycle. So the quality of the road doesn't take away from it being a road. A logging road, when it's not shut down because of logging, is still a road. And it's a public road on federal or state property. So the rule would apply to it. Okay. I think probably what would play out in that kind of a situation would be the other part, the other tests of, a, of the goal exception um, to kind of show like the public, like protective, purpose for that you know like why would you be protecting that if it's a logging road that's not necessarily going to serve different things different functions so I think that would probably be okay and I would struggle to see the state or the federal putting a lot of money to shore up a bank to protect that road when in that case it's probably easier just to relocate the road yeah which again which is Charlie mentioned we should should incentivize them to do that but the rule would apply that, that I just wanted to flag that. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Okay, so it's about 3.42. Um, we can talk about this for a few more minutes and then I'll probably wanna talk about um, our next steps, but I'll share my screen one more time. 
and we can look at where the language stands now and please let me know, let me, or flag anything that you feel uncomfortable with at this moment in time. Can everyone see that okay? Kind of my my other my the same comment as far as uh, roads and highways that were developed on as of January first, nineteen seventy seven would also apply to any road you can drive a, a motorcycle down by the definition of what a road is. Do you foresee that being a problem for the oceanfront? Okay. Anyone else? Anything you feel uncomfortable with? Okay. Well, if you something dawns on you, please feel free to share it with with me, and then I'll share it with the group. Um, Thank you so much. This has been a really good conversation. And I think we have gotten a lot out of this, I hope anyway. Um, Charlie, I see your hand up. Do you want to go? Oops, sorry. I just want to say, I, I, you know, I feel like we're close. I feel a little loose still on, on the, the why. So this protecting and stabilizing piece I just, I still feel like we're a little open on that. Um, and I wouldn't mind like talking that through a little bit more at, in a future meeting uh, if possible. Okay. The like protecting and stabilizing language, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we've done a nice job of narrowing down the circumstances around the, where this exception would apply, but exactly why, under what, I, I feel like there's still a little nebulousness. And, and the reason I heard was, was that, you know, a city or a county or a, an entity wouldn't go through the trouble of it, of all of this for the, it, you know, for the expense and everything. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a good way to write the policy um, for that reason. Um, I can think of leadership having some pretty uh, wackadoodle ideas um, and a lot of money coming available um, at odd times before. And I'd hate for that to turn into a, a, a bad, big exception uh, in an area. I mean, do you think that there is a big section of road where you would have a lot of heartburn over it getting riprap? Well, that was one of the reasons why I asked if, uh, early on about if there's any kind of an analysis, because I don't know what I'm grounding my potential concerns in. Um, because I don't, I'm not looking at like, what is the potential for the Oregon coast? What I do think about is that, you know, incentivizing landward retreats really important because we're losing shoreline. Um, so there's going to be more and more public fronting roads and highways, um, into the future. And I think that this is going to be a very much needed exception um, and so I think determining how far we roll this with the easement that is the rolling easement of our coast is a big question. Um, and, and if we want to not roll it forever, then we have to incentivize some direction inward. And that's hard. Um, I mean, we heard from Chris, you know, that's not that those are big trade offs there, sometimes some big environmental ones, some big costs. Um, but we have to find ways to incentivize that. And I just wonder what can we do now to be thinking about that? That's my platform. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I just want to add one thing because Laurel um, put in a chat looking um, at the 
list of directly oceanfront public roads, um, not looking at eligibility at the moment, but sections of oceanfront roads here that are non-101. And there's quite a few communities, uh, both um, rural and urban that have oceanfront non-101 roads. Uh, so it looks like, even though we don't know the mileage involved, it looks like there's quite a bit. It would not just apply to 101 principally. Yeah, thank you. I didn't get past Winchester Bay. I was just <laughs> Okay, that's, it. you know, that's two thirds. And... Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and I mean, for the eligibility thing, they're all gonna be not eligible which is why they would then be eligible for this exception. Because the definition of development does not include roads at all. I meant year. So I don't know the year yes, that's a good that point. those roads, <laughs> like they were just yeah. roads that had no homes between them and the ocean and they weren't 101. So I was just skimming through. Yeah. I don't know when they were built. That's what I meant by. Gotcha. Eligibility. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. They, um, that is certainly a, a challenge with doing the GIS analysis is just like the development date is always, it's not always clear um, from older records. So um, that is challenging, but thank you, Laurel, for doing that quick. Um, and like the Highway 101, I mean, it's roughly 19 miles, it's probably less. Um, and so, yeah, whatever this adds up to be, it could be at least that, maybe more. Um, and there, just as a reminder, there's about 45 miles of the shoreline is currently armored. Thanks, Chris. So did we ever make a uh, firm decision about putting in some or another language about um, uh, ocean fronting public roads, meaning not roads that have a house between, have houses between them and the ocean? I think that was the that was why we did the primary purpose and the ocean fronting public roads okay. that that language to to make that clear. Okay. Um, so this is what I can propose to do um, since we're getting close to four o'clock. Um, is uh, I will share this language as it stands, and um, if you come up with alternative language, especially to deal with that, sort of like the why, why are we going to allow these um, roads to be protected? Um, please share it with me and then I will share it with the group. And at our next meeting on March 17th, we can have a final discussion about the language because um, the other piece of the next meeting will be on the fiscal impact statement, which is a requirement of all rulemakings. And I'll just share that piece really fast so that you can see what that means. Um, I anticipate that this will be very easy for us. I'll have to do a little more digging on it, but um, I don't think that this rulemaking is going to have um, that much of an economic impact on businesses. Um, and it's just what how it changes from the status quo, not the overall fiscal impact of the entire rule. So I think for this, it's like going to be pretty negligible because we're not really doing anything to businesses. It's just on um, the road. Um, and then there is a new piece that was added from the last session that we also need to do a racial impact statement, identifying how the adoption of the rule will affect racial equity in the state. Um, so we'll have to do both of those things at our next meeting. Um, but I think we could probably have enough room if we did another two hour meeting um, to do a final discussion on the rule language and the fiscal impact statement. Um, we could also potentially make it a three hour meeting just in case, or we could add a fourth meeting. Um, does anyone have an opinion about, so those are three options. Just keep it as is March 17th, two hours add an extra hour to the March 17th meeting or add a fourth meeting. Uh, if you can put in the chat what your preference is or tell me, you can just say it, come off mute too. Um, let me know. Chris. I think because we're, we're not a rule, we're making a statement. And to me, a public road is a public road. So the racial impact is pretty much negligible. Um, fiscal impact, um, I think is also fairly easy to go. So. I would say one 
uh, to our meeting. And if we need to run long, we at that point can decide to do a fourth meeting. I think I would agree that a fourth meeting as a possible option is the best way because if we end up with a, a disagreement or a real problem uh, in language or fiscal impact or whatever, uh, it probably will need more time anyhow between us or with council uh, to straighten it out. So I would keep it to a regular two hour meeting and uh, with the option of a fourth meeting if next time it turns out we need it. Uh, on the fiscal impact statement, I would just want to say that since it's uh, the state agencies or the agencies estimate the rules, economic effect on businesses, uh, if anything, it should be a positive effect. It's probably better for a business to have a road that functions rather than a road that is crumbling into the sea. Um, so if anything, it should be uh, not a problem, but the reverse. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Okay, thank you. I saw some other chats too, just that agreed one to our meeting, um, and then we can we can discuss the possibility of a fourth meeting if if we need to at that last one. Um, any other anyone disagree with that? Okay, great. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so our next meeting is March 17th at 2 p.m. It's a Thursday. We'll do the same thing, um, meet via Zoom. We will um, discuss this language and the fiscal impact statement. Um, like I said, if you do have thoughts about language changes um, to what we just discussed, please send them to me before the meeting and I'll share that with the rest of the group. Um, and uh, all the meeting materials will be made available on our rulemaking webpage as they have been. Hopefully you um, have found that webpage. Um, we will be posting the meeting summary within two weeks uh, of this meeting, um, as well as the recording. And um, if you know of anyone who does want to provide comment, please let them know they can, they can provide written comments to me. Um, and I think that's it. Any other thoughts or questions before we adjourn? I really appreciate all the time that you've spent today. It was a very good discussion. And um, uh, Laurel, do you have a, something? You might have already said this before, but is there a date already for the hearing? I'm assuming you're having a rules hearing or no? Um, you know, I, I think it will just be at our May LCDC here meeting. And I'm not sure if that meeting has been set. I don't know. Patty, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know if there is a meeting date for that? The short answer is yes. I'm just looking it up right here. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I can see if I can find it quickly too, but it would be our um, LCDC meeting in May. It looks um, like the, the 19th and 20th. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Laurel. It's a great question. So um, 19th and 20th of May will be the first hearing. We will we have not set a date for the geographic hearing, which will be, but it will be in June. Um, and if we're allowing in-person things to happen, it will take place on the coast, uh, but otherwise it will just be a virtual meeting. And then um, our, um, you know, if all goes well, our July LCDC meetings, which is July 21st and 22nd, that's when there would be, it would be up for final adoption. Um, and then the rule would become effective in August of 2022. So that's a good reminder of the timeline that we are working in. Um, so we're well on the way and, and having making good progress. So uh, definitely really appreciate all of your time. This was really helpful and insightful discussion. So um, thank you and uh, have a good couple of weeks until I see you all yet. Hey Meg, I just wanted yeah. to say that normally when we do rulemaking, it's on the first day on that. So it probably, be okay. on the, yeah. So Great. that's good to know. Get held over. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you all. Take care.